Join me in New Orleans, November 12th through the 14th for the CHAD International Conference on ADHD. Go register at chad.org and register before October 5th to lock in your early bird discount. Let's say we eat a steak. That provides a lot of amino acids into our bloodstream. And these amino acids go up to our brain and they kind of have to wait in line for a while and because it takes a while for them to seep into our brain. While they are waiting in line, if we have an insulin spike, that insulin will remove those amino acids from the line to, to try to get into our brain. And so those brain chemicals cannot be formed. Even though we're eating protein, like we have a steak, because we ate mashed potatoes and had a Coke with it, that's blocking those, brain, those amino acids from getting into our brain. ADHD Rewired, episode 82. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me thank our sponsors. Boom, 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 Trial.com slash ADHD Rewired for your free Trial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Trial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired for your free audiobook download. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I am here with my guest, Carl Pills. Carl is a former member of the corporate world who allowed work and business to overtake his life to the point where he ballooned to your, your thing says 22 pounds. That's huge, man. That's huge. Oh, 227, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> to 227 pounds and uh, with zero energy. Uh, he decided to dive into the nutrition world and committed himself to learning the truth about how the body works. After losing 53 pounds, because if you started with 22 and lost 53, you'd be, you'd be gone, uh-huh. right? That'd be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Carl now helps others take a similar journey through his website, nutritiontotheedge.com. And I'm too busy for a nutrition podcast. And uh, I reached out to Carl after listening to one of his podcast episodes on nutrition. Because one of the things that I, uh, I often hear in the nutrition world, it's, you know, it's, people are talking about this, this extreme thing things that you have to do and it just turns me off and what i liked about carl is he took almost that opposite approach uh very kind of brain-based uh really uh, looking at both the limitations of what the science shows as well as looking at not just you know food but everything in our as how we practice really life so carl welcome to the podcast Thanks, Eric. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to have you on because this is we. Have, I have not really had a guest on yet that that have, have uh, that's explored this issue. Um, you know, it's I, I sort of lean towards the side of of really hard evidence about stuff. So when it when it comes to like dietary stuff, it's like how much do we really know? And so I just want to um, you know thank you for your the way you you approach uh, diet and nutrition. Um, because it, for you, you, you talk a lot about the brain and how, how the brain responds to the, the stuff that we eat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I always, you know, I came from when I was growing up, I was always kind of an anxious and nervous and sometimes depressed kid. And I saw, I had a couple of friends that I hung around that were actually very, you know, outgoing and charismatic and people liked them and all that stuff. And I was always wondering why that wasn't the case for me. And I saw that there were spurts of time when I was more like that. And I always thought, was like, why can't I do that all the time? And so, um, you know, eventually when I got into the corporate world and I saw my energy and focus really deteriorating. And when I started launching, when I started correlating it to what I ate, I started to see that what I ate made a difference. And when I really went into that, you know, that really was a game changer. You know, I was, my undergrad is in engineering. So I was used to kind of, taking apart complicated systems and figuring out how they worked. And that actually really helped me with this, you know, kind of venture because the bottom, the body is a system, 
but it has inputs and outputs and it has different ways that different systems relate to each other. And there's a lot of moving parts, but it's not that hard to figure out from, you know, basically a metabolic standpoint. And so that was, you know, what you need to know is not that complicated. And it's basically a lot of stuff that we've been taught for years. It's just that, you know, there's all kinds of all kinds of opinions out there and everybody's giving tips and tricks and all that stuff. But I always wanted to know, tell me how it works. I don't need tips or tricks. I want to know how it works. You want to get, you want to really understand the, the, you want to understand on a much deeper level. Mm -hmm. Um, and now to, uh, just to kind of, um, so listeners know, um, you, you don't have ADHD, um, to the best that we know. Well, maybe we'll, we'll think about that at the end of the episode and we'll, we'll Mm -hmm. figure it out. (laughs) Um, (laughs) No. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, so I just wanted to, most of the guests that have been on the show uh, do have ADHD as well. Um, but the reason I really wanted to bring you on just because of, of how I, I think your the perspective that you take on nutrition um, is one that I think is going to be really valuable uh, for my listeners. Um, but I did want to, you know, because people might be wondering um, mm-hmm. about that. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Um, no, I, you know, I talked about how, you know, growing up, I was very nervous and anxious and all mm-hmm. that stuff. And you know, I don't know if back then I would have diagnosed, been diagnosed with mild ADHD. I mean, who knows? But um, I do know what, what it was like to, to fight those feelings of anxiety and depression and nervousness and stuff like that. Uh, maybe not as so severe as some people, but I knew mm-hmm. I, I do know what it feels like. And that's kind of what drove me down this path. So when I mean, you're talking about input and output, you know, the, the fir- one of the first things that comes to my mind is, you know, when I'm working with, with clients is, you know, I, I tell them, I'm going to give you 101 maybe different ideas, and most of them aren't going to work. What we're trying to do is figure out the ones that do, because that, those can change your life, mm-hmm. right? And so when I think about input, output, it's about experimenting and seeing what what we put into our lives or what we try and see what the result is. So Talk to me about about how that is with food. Like, how did you kind of uh, uh, start to say, you know, when I'm eating this or that, like I'm noticing how I'm feeling. Like, what was one, what kind of had you kind of go down that path? You know, everybody's body is different. And certain, some people have sensitivities to foods that other people don't. And what you have to have is a starting point. And a good starting point is learning how your body is supposed to work, you know, textbook. And then going down the path and seeing where you tend to veer off, because that will give you a clue as to where you need to check and see. Maybe I have a, a sensitivity here, but we always need a starting point. And that was the point that I really wanted to get to. I was trying to understand how the body works to the point where I could tell people, this is where you should start. Then as you go along your path, you'll, you'll start to notice that different things are happening to you than what's being told should happen. And when that's the case, then you have to take a look at it. And so that's like, like there's a lot of people with dairy allergies or gluten sensitivities or something like that. And so you have to evaluate all that stuff. But there is a central point that we can all start from. And, and so what, so how, you know, if you're looking at, um, if someone's curious, if they do have sensitivities to certain foods, how do you, like, what do you think the best way to, to kind of approach that is just kind of try to take certain things out of their diet or what? Yeah, you do what's called a, an elimination diet mm-hmm. and you go on foods, you know, a diet based uh, entirely of foods that are pretty much known to be non-reactive for the vast majority of people. And you start adding things back in and see which one causes the symptoms to come back. Mm-hmm. And so that's what people do a lot. And it does work greatly. It's that's hard to do, though, especially uh, <laughs> for, for, you know, the, the population of, of listeners here, you know, it's but I think that when you know, so one of my issues with our stories, I guess, based of, of nutrition and, uh, you know, I'm always looking for for ways to, to improve my productivity, to, you know, kind of make my thinking more clear and less foggy. And a couple of years ago, I read a, um, a book um, by an ADHD expert, um, I'm blanking on his name, uh, Vince Minostra. And he was talking a lot about uh, just the, the science of the nutrition of, of the brain. He was really, this is one of the first times I really heard about how important protein is, especially for the ADHD brain. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, all right, well, let me let me try this. Because there were certain things that he was describing. I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds totally like me. Where I would, I would start my morning and have a healthy bowl of cereal um you know high carbohydrate um with with you know fruits and um and i mean i would have like a pot of coffee um and i would like fall asleep 
and when I heard about this, like, how, the, like the the reason as to why it's the and and correct me if, my, if I'm not understanding it correctly, um, that it takes the brain a lot of energy to break down those carbohydrates, um, and and the, the research was showing in the ADHD brain that. Um, we produce an excessive amount of tryptophan that which mm-hmm. is like that you know the, the chemical that makes you sleepy during thanksgiving dinner mm-hmm. so they say mm-hmm. uh from, from the turkey um so i decided to do an experiment and say you know let me try to make an, and so i started experimenting with different kind of protein shake recipes um and i i found one about three years ago or so and i've been having that almost every single morning because i noticed a clear difference i mean it was mm-hmm. to me it was almost like night and day and it's so i've always been i've been so curious about the impact of food but then also struggle with it's really hard sometimes to eat way, in ways that are good for our our mind and for our body because all that stuff takes time and planning and these executive functioning skills that aren't always our uh, greatest strength. Yeah. Um, but I do think that when we understand the why, it, it increases our motivation to make change. You know, it makes it – when you bring clarity to a topic, you, may, you automatically make it easier. It's when we don't understand something that there's all this stress around it. You know, when we know the when we know the process of arriving at an answer, then there's no stress about the question. You know, it's like when we're taking a test in school. When we've studied, we're not stressing about it. <laughs> but um, but you know, all those things, the um, uh, the brain chemicals like serotonin that, that you talked about, we'll talk about all that. Um, you know, one of the things that you're doing when you uh, eat a cereal sugar filled breakfast is you're actually starving the brain for periods of time. And we'll get into all that too. But what you, you know, in my, in my podcast, really the reason that I started my podcast, the I'm too busy for nutrition podcast is because people are too busy to turn their lives upside down to assemble the ideal diet. And that's what everybody, all the health gurus and the diet book authors and all that stuff are all preaching about the ideal And that's great and everything if you have the time and resources to do it. But most people living on this earth don't. And so what they need to know is, you know, I talk about the 80-20 rule of nutrition. You want the maximum benefits for the least amount of effort. Sign me up for that. (laughs) Yeah. So we find that 20% of effort that will get you the 80% of your results. Mm -hmm. And so there are little things that you can do to cause massive benefits and 20 minutes to a half an hour later. You know what? One of my beefs with nutrition is that we're supposed to do put all this energy and effort forth right now, and our reward will be 40 years down the road, and we'll be disease-free. That's not very motivating. <laughs> right, and especially for, for the ADHD brain, there, that will not connect, like because mm-hmm. uh, the, our time horizon, just from a neurological level, it doesn't extend that far, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, you know, what I really want, what I started to learn and what I really find people react to is the, is the, the realization that what you put in your mouth right now will affect how you feel in 20 minutes to a half an hour. And if you can make yourself feel better in a half an hour by what you're eating right now, that's a a lot clearer goal, a lot clearer reward that you'll get for doing something good. Mm -hmm. And it's a smart, it's a much more salient one. It's going to actually like be effective because our, our, our brain responds to things that make us feel good and the, the things that don't make us feel good. But that the, the, the time between the behavior and the reward needs to be short in order for it to really stick. Much better. I like teaching the immediacy of nutrition because nobody else does from what I can tell. You were talking our language, Carl. Let's, let's do this. So, <laughs> so the immediacy of nutrition. So what are some things that people can maybe look out for um, if they're feeling, say, foggy? What are some things that they can do immediately that might help? You know, one of the things that that I really focus on is a lot of people don't know that our feelings of energy and focus, you know, our clarity, they are he- heavily influenced by brain chemicals. They're called neurotransmitters. Mm-hmm. And some are called, you know, one is called serotonin or also dopamine and mm-hmm. adrenaline and endorphins. You know, we've all heard about these in popular culture somewhere. And these brain chemicals, they're actually the same ones that pharmaceutical companies target with some of their antidepressant drugs Mm -hmm. uh, because they know how powerful they are. Mm -hmm. And so these brain chemicals have a serious influence on how we feel. So if we can bump them up to a a pretty high level, that will help us have a lot of energy and a lot of focus. Now, that's building them. Now, what most people are doing, you know, 
what most people don't know is that the right foods build these brain chemicals, but the wrong foods and the wrong habits destroy these brain chemicals. And that's why a lot of people have a, a rough time focusing and maintaining their energy. It's because three to five times a day, which eat with each meal and snack, people are sabotaging these brain chemicals without knowing it. Okay, get, let's, let's get into some specifics here. Okay. Right. Um, the brain chemicals that control how we feel. Like, let's start with serotonin. Mm -hmm. Serotonin is our, um, you know, we know from uh, uh, serotonin is our natural antidepressant. Mm -hmm. So when it's high, we feel confident and optimistic, basically ready to take on anything. Right. It's why we use SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, as exactly. a, as a uh, medication for depression. Mm -hmm. It's our natural antidepressant. Um, now, dopamine and adrenaline, those are our action and focus brain chemicals. Mm -hmm. When those are high, then we have a lot of energy and we have a lot of focus. We have a lot of clarity. Fogginess goes away. And then there's our endorphins. You know, we've all heard about endorphins, you know, uh, chocolate and sex raise our endorphins. But uh, endorphins are what really allow us to, they give us the feelings of being able to enjoy our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, a good way of putting it is endorphins allow you to feel the rush of life, you know. And so these are the brain chemicals and there are others, but they have a very heavy influence in how we feel. And so what we, the best thing that we can do for ourselves is build them up to where they should be and prevent them from deteriorating. And that's what we can do from food with food. Uh, these brain chemicals are built directly from protein. And so whether it's beef or chicken or fish or beans or dairy, wherever you get your protein, that gives us the building blocks for these brain chemicals. And they are actually amino acids. Um, amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, are the building blocks of these brain chemicals. Like, okay, so if we eat a steak, we chew it, it goes into our stomach, and during digestion, it gets broken down into individual amino acids. Some of them are tryptophan. Uh, tyrosine is another. Uh, alanine and glutamine are others. So all these different amino acids are now in our stomach, and then they hop into our bloodstream. And they start circulating around our body to do a lot of different things, uh, make muscle, make bone, make blood. But a lot of them head up to our brain to make these uh, brain chemicals, these neurotransmitters. Now, when they get up there, different amino acids make the different brain chemicals. Like tryptophan will combine with vitamins. Okay, so... The formula for making brain chemicals is amino acid plus vitamins equal brain chemicals. So tryptophan will combine with vitamins and create serotonin. Okay. Say, say and, that again the, from the, the amino acid part because my brain is just going well. I just recently took out um, wheat germ from my smoothie recipe um, mm -hmm. just to see if decreasing the, the carbohydrate would, would help. Um, uh, at all. Um, I, I have some, some irritable bowel syndrome stuff going yep. on. Um, mm -hmm. and it did, did seem to help, but you know, the reason I had it in there, uh, was for the amino acid. So, mm -hmm. so I was really interested when you said, so say that again, the amino acid plus the amino acids plus vitamins okay. equal brain chemicals. Okay. Okay. So all these amino acids are, are going up to our brain and tryptophan will combine with vitamins and make serotonin. Uh, tyrosine is another amino acid, which will combine with vitamins to make adrenaline and dopamine, our action and focus brain chemicals. And then phenylalanine is another amino acid, which will combine with vitamins to make our endorphins. That's how our endorphins are built. So that's how if we eat protein, we will give our body the necessary building blocks to create these brain chemicals. Okay. Okay. So, um, Real quick, what I'm going to make sure that, that we – I'm just going to make a, a note here that we'll have the those equations that you just said on the show notes because mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm sitting here like wanting to like process that. I, I want to push pause on what we just said and like rewind it just because I'm, I'm learning a lot because I, mean, I, I don't know enough about nutrition. So this is – I'm like getting excited here just you know learning about it. But it's one of those things where like, okay, I need to like see it and hear it and like kind of mm -hmm. digest it. No pun intended. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> grown right um, and uh, so okay all right so the, actually you know what i have this whole process in video form and we can provide the link to that to your audience killer that's awesome that's awesome mm -hmm. thank you oh i, I like video 
Mm-hmm. All right. So keep on um, going here. So that's if we give our body protein, then we're giving the building blocks to build these amino acids. So what do you think is the first mistake that people make? They take the wrong things out. Well, no, they don't give their, they don't include enough protein at each meal. Okay. They don't provide the building blocks. You know, a lot of people will start breakfast off with a bowl of cereal or they have pizza for lunch or they have a bowl of spaghetti for dinner or they'll just have coffee for breakfast. You know, there, there's no building blocks for these brain chemicals. And so we're not building them like we should. Okay. That's, that's mistake number one. Okay. Now, mistake number two is doing something to, even though we're giving these building blocks to our brain, we're also doing something that is preventing the brain chemicals from being formed. And that's where carbs and sugar come in. Okay. Let's talk about that. Okay. Now let's shift to how carbohydrates are digested. When we eat any carbs, um, I don't care if it's sugar or candy or vegetables or fruit, any carb that we eat, will go into our stomach and get digested and turned into sugar. And then that sugar will be dumped into our bloodstream. And that's what we call blood sugar. Okay. So we're going to be talking a lot about blood sugar. That's how it goes from carbs to blood sugar. So basically from the, from after it's broken down, our body does not know the difference between um, unfrosted shredded wheats and chocolate cake. Basically. Okay. Yep. All right. Pretty much. Now, the difference between the different carbs is how long that digestive process takes, how long it takes to go from carbs to sugar. And is that, and like, the, is that like the whole idea of complex carbohydrates? Kind of. But even, you know, potatoes are typically are typically are technically uh, complex. So I like to stick with the terms quick carbs and slow carbs. OK. OK. And the differentiator is fiber. Fiber slows the the digestion of carbs. So if you have like fruits and vegetables have lots of fiber, those digest very slowly. And so let's take a look at what happens. When you eat high fiber carbs, they digest very slowly. And so little bits of sugar enter our bloodstream at once. It's kind of like an IV drip of sugar into our bloodstream. And... Our body likes to maintain our blood sugar in a certain range, not too high and not too low. And when it has this slow drip of carbs coming into our bloodstream, then our blood sugar level will rise very slowly and over the period of several hours. That is how our body likes it. When that's going on, our body is completely happy. Okay, now the problem comes when we eat quick digesting carbohydrates. Okay? Like? So I'm talking about uh, sugar, sodas, candy, cookies, muffins, and like those are the sugars and then white carbohydrates, which are, uh, white bread, white rice, white pasta, uh, cookies and crackers, that type of thing. Anything made with white flour. What about things that are other things that people might think are healthy, but fall into that category? Um, pretzels, pretzels. Okay. Yeah. Pretzels or those rice cakes. Oh, those rice cakes were <laughs> such a scam. <laughs> Oh man, nothing but nothing but quick carbs. But so you know, if, if they can throw the word cake on the end of it, and, I'll, and people are going to be convinced, <laughs> <laughs> it must be good. <laughs> oh man, but yeah, you know these carbs. If it's the sugar, the sugar has no fiber in it naturally. Uh, the white carbs, like the white flour, it has all the fiber stripped out during manufacturing, hmm. so it has little to no fiber in it. Also, same thing with white rice. It's all stripped away. And so these carbs have little to no fiber in them. So when we eat them, they get digested very quickly, like 20 minutes, Uh, 20 minutes, half an hour. And so that causes a lot of sugar to be dumped into our bloodstream all at once. So instead of the the IV drip, it's like slicing your your arm open and just pouring sugar water on it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And that causes our blood sugar level to rise very high and very quickly. And that's what we call a blood sugar spike. Okay. Okay. So now remember that we said our blood sugar or our body likes to maintain our blood sugar in a certain healthy range, not too high. Well, now with a blood sugar spike, our blood sugar level is way too high. So our body has to do something about it because it doesn't like that. And so our body sends out insulin. Insulin will go into your bloodstream 
And its job is to remove all the excess blood sugar in order to drive our blood sugar level back down into that healthy range. And what insulin does is it takes all the extra sugar and it dumps it into our cells. It removes it from our bloodstream and dumps it into our cells. Now, here's the kicker. You know, we're talking about energy and focus and all that, but let's talk about weight. When insulin removes all, takes all that extra sugar out of our blood and dumps it into our fat, into our cells, it's dumping it into fat cells. The vast majority goes to fat storage, and that's the number one reason in the world why we are all gaining weight. Hmm because of these quick digesting carbohydrates and that process. Let, let me synthesize what I'm hearing so far for a moment. It's so it sounds like one of the where this becomes both challenging but at the same time really critical is that we can't just look at one component of nutrition in order to to help ourselves feel better whether it's mentally or just physically that the, we really do have to understand how these things all interact together. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yep. So, um, so from a weight perspective, it's devastated for our weight, but let's go back to energy and focus. When, when we cause a blood sugar spike and insulin comes and removes all the excess sugar, the kicker for our energy and focus levels is that insulin will also remove amino acids from our bloodstream. So let's go back to protein for a second. And that's, that's what brings the protein, right? Yeah. Okay. So when we eat, like, let's say we eat a steak. That provides a lot of amino acids into our bloodstream, and these amino acids go up to our brain, and they kind of have to wait in line for a while, like trying to get into a club, and because it takes a while for them to seep into our brain. Well, while they are waiting in line, if we have an insulin spike, that insulin will remove those amino acids from the line to, to try to get into our brain. And it shoves those into our cells also. And the result is the amino acids never make it into our brain. And so those brain chemicals cannot be formed. And so even though we're eating protein, like we have a steak, we're providing those amino acids, the building blocks for the brain chemicals. But because we ate mashed potatoes and had a Coke with it, that's causing an insulin spike, which is blocking those, brain, those amino acids from getting into our brain. Wow. And so they're okay. not all of our effort, all of our effort to get uh, to eat that protein, it's all wasted. So the whole notion of like steak and potatoes. Yeah. It's, it's not good. You should be eating steak and do green beans flipped in butter. Or a salad with I like the butter protein. part. I mean that <laughs> Uh -huh. That's a whole, you know, that's a whole nother topic, which we can get into, but the way to make uh, the side dishes good and also healthy is by adding fats. And that includes butter and creams and animal fats. We'll get into that. We'll get into that. I'm but kind, yeah, I'm kind of just salivating on the idea of like a butter, just buttery goodness. You know, um, and if you, do, if you do salads, make it loaded with cheese you can put bacon on it you can do ranch and blue cheese you can nuts. do a vinaigrette nuts and you can go liberal with the dressing you know that has to do with how your appetite works wow mm -hmm. but right now you know we've talked about two things we need to add protein and we need to make sure that we are not eating quick digesting carbohydrates okay do you want to talk about a way that you can recognize a quick carb from a slow carb sure Let's okay because a lot of us are busy, and so we need the quick way to recognize them. You know what, uh, what we should do? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that in a quick moment. Let me just take a quick break to thank my sponsors, and we'll be right back. All righty. Support for this podcast comes from Audible. For a free audiobook download, go to ericktivers.com slash audible for a link for that free download and for some hand-picked recommendations, go to erictibbers.com slash audible for your free audiobook download. Get a Zoom room. Go to erictibbers.com slash 
Zoom. I use Zoom video conferencing for the ADHD rewired coaching and accountability group. Zoom makes video conferencing fun and easy. Share your screen, collaborate with a whiteboard, record the audio and video. It's ADHD friendly. Go free or go pro, but go to ericktivers.com slash Zoom so they know that I sent you. That's ericktivers.com slash Zoom. All right, we are back with Carl Pills, and he is going to help us see what a a quick way to recognize a a slow carb from a quick carb. Did I get that right? Yep, yep. That working memory piece, I had to like hold like three pieces of information in my mind while like setting it back (laughs) up from the break. (laughs) All right, so how do we recognize the difference? Okay, so if you're in the store and you're looking to buy cereal or bread or something like that, you want to find a slow carb. Uh, When you look at the label, there is a listing for the amount of carbohydrates in grams per serving. Mm -hmm. There is also a line item for the amount of fiber in grams per serving. And what you're looking for is at least three grams of fiber per 20 grams of carbohydrates. If you have at least three grams of fiber per 20 grams of carbs, then you have enough fiber to keep that carbohydrate digesting nice and slow. And so that will not cause a blood sugar spike. That will keep it to more like that IV drip of sugar into your bloodstream. So like for me, like when I, when I would look at a, a nutrition label and see something that's in the 20 or 30 grams of carbs, I, I, have, I typically just like avoid those kinds of things. Am I, am I thinking about it too simplicity, too simplistic? Well, you know what I'm trying to say, Carl? Yeah, simplistically, yeah. <laughs> um, a good rule of thumb that I tell people, if you really want to do uh, things right, um, you should really keep your, your total carbohydrates per meal at 25 grams or under per meal. So, um, but you know, if you're looking at grains or something like that, grains tend to come in servings of like a half a cup or something like that. And so that tends to be right around 20. That's why I use that number 20, Mm -hmm. but that is easy to divide into 20. Um, so three grams of fiber per 20 grams of carbs. Now, if you have something and it has 2.8 grams of carbs or 2.8 grams of fiber per 20 grams of carbs, don't get it. It will di- it will digest too quickly. So really, if it's that, but so you're saying that two point eight versus three is really that significant of a of a difference. It's just don't do it. Really, <laughs> you know, everybody everybody's body is a little bit different. So what I tell people is stick to three. The more you can huh. stick to three, the better. Okay. Okay. Will it be devastating? Maybe not. But once you give yourself permission to do two point eight, you'll also give yourself permission to do two point six and two point four. Okay. And then okay. two, and then there's like, there's, there's some. And then, <laughs> exactly. Okay. All right. So, all right. So I'm thinking about that ratio. So man, it's, it's not just about choosing what you eat, but it's really thinking about the, this, like how all these foods combine together each time you have a meal. And mm-hmm. it sounds like it's too, it's not just about daily allowances. It's a, it's, we should be thinking about it more of as a meal allowance. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, the, the third aspect is adding the fat, and we'll talk about that in a second. But once you bring fat back in our diet, fat is what regulates our appetite. It regulates our uh, hormone leptin, which controls our appetite. If we eat fat, it will raise leptin and it will shut off our hunger. The problem is that we've been told for the last 50 years that we should be eating low-fat diets. Well, anybody who's gone on a healthy diet of you know, grilled chicken and dry salads and steamed vegetables know that you cannot stick to that long term. And the reason is because it does nothing to address your appetite. But once you rid yourself of the idea that fat is bad for us and start adding, you know, a good bit of fat, you know, half an avocado or something like that. um, Once you add that, your appetite re-regulates and now you you no longer need to snack. And that's a big deal because snack foods are one of the worst things. It, those are some of the worst traps for destroying our waistlines and our energy and focus for those snack foods because they're almost always some type of quick digesting carb or soda. What about something like the, uh, you know, there's a lot of these like protein bars. Mm, protein bars, a lot of them tend to be high in sugar. 
Okay. If you look at a lot of protein bars, there'll be 30 grams of sugar in them. So you have to watch. You know, I used to uh, eat a daily like protein bar. I don't remember what kind it was. And I, and I just stopped because I was thinking, because I was watching the, the, both the, um, the, my waistline and I was, I was starting to not be able to see my, um, the button on my pants because my, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, I got it. So I, so I was starting to get in the habit of getting back on the scale every day, which is just a way that I just help monitor. And I'm like, all right, what is like one? Cause I really wasn't, eat, I didn't think that I was eating like badly. I wasn't like pegging out and stuff and eating a bunch of crap. Um, but I, so I decided to just take out that one thing that this protein bar during the really? day. And I don't remember what the time frame was, but I, I lost at least 10 pounds just removing that from my diet. Mm, a lot of them, uh, like, what's one of the worst ones? Oh, those cliff bars. Oh, man. Yeah. You look at one of those, and there's like 40 grams of carbs in it. It's yeah. terrible. Oh, man. Yeah, some of them out there. Now, when you're looking at protein bars, you can use that same rule. Look for three grams of fiber per 20 grams of carbs. And try to make sure that your protein bar doesn't have more than 20 to 25 grams of carbs. Okay. If you All have right. one with 40, well, I don't care. I, I, think, I, think, I think I have one of them in my office, and I actually want to check to see it. So you can give me the, the lowdown on this. So hang on yeah, one okay. sec. All right, so I just grabbed from my uh, my kind of snack stash that I have here in my office um, the the all the generic brand of um, of the protein bar that I like. Um, it says it has 10 grams of protein, um, 180 calories. It doesn't have the actual all the nutrition label the stuff on it. Um, I don't. Do you recognize? that um, i mean it has oh, chocolate oh. on it so you know it's yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 <laughs> peanut butter and chocolate is like my favorite combination like my, that's, oh, that's my that's my smoothie my uh, smoothie recipe in the morning mm -hmm. um so something like that what, what do you think what i'd like to see in a protein bar is a lot more than 10 10 grams of uh protein okay and also if you look on the back there there should be the carbs and then the fiber what do those say um, I think it's the Aldi brand, so uh, that's on the box. They don't they don't put that on the, on the individual package. Oh, um, you're kidding! No, it's it says not for individual sale. Um, flip flip open the flip the that tab underneath it. No, it it surprisingly it doesn't. Oh, no kidding! Yeah, yeah. Look at the box. You know, first thing is if it doesn't have the the amount of fiber, you know, the three grams of fiber per twenty grams of carbs. I wouldn't eat it, but okay. also in a protein bar, I'd like to see at least 25 grams of protein. It's okay. a protein bar. Right. <laughs> That's <the> point. <laughs> now, is there a um, is there an amount of uh, of protein that is like over like that? It's too much that the body can't really um, handle. Your body can really anything over 40 per meal. Uh, your body can only digest so much protein at once, and so anything over 40 is kind of wasted. Even bodybuilders talk about that. Um, but, you know, a good rule of thumb for uh, how much protein you need per day, you know, at minimum, uh, about a half a gram of protein per pound of body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you know, at minimum, you should get 100. But a really good rule of thumb is for any man should be getting between 30 and 40 at each meal. If you're a smaller woman, like a 100 pound woman, probably 25 per meal. But that's a pretty good that's a pretty good range. Okay, okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, gluten sensitivities because mm -hmm. that's that's a um, kind of a, a hot topic, uh, especially in the in the world of autism. And we also know there's a lot of overlap between autism and, and ADHD. Um, so what's what's your take on it? You know, gluten um, for the longest time. The idea around gluten was you either have celiac disease in which you really can't take gluten or you don't. And if you don't have celiac disease, you don't need to worry about gluten. That has significantly changed over the last five to 10 years. And so now a lot of people are looking at gluten sensitivities. But uh, what I think from the people that I've worked with is a lot more people have some level of gluten sensitivity than they think. You know, some people may have a mild gluten sensitivity. And so the more they remove gluten, probably the better off that they are. And it just so happens that gluten is in a lot of the carbs that we need to get rid of. 
<laughs> so a lot of people end up losing weight on a gluten on a gluten free diet simply because they're removing a lot of the quick digesting carbs. Now, can you do a gluten like reduction diet, or is that kind of like one of those things where either you have to remove it or it's or it doesn't really um, do anything? And it depends on your sensitivity. Mm -hmm. You could uh, you could lower it and see if that works. But if you have a gluten sensitivity, that's not something to take lightly because uh, gluten sensitivities can cause um, all kinds of uh, mental issues uh, with your energy and focus and all that stuff. Uh, people with you know ADHD and autism tend to have a rough time with it, but also it tends to do things like cause cravings, which are detrimental to anything nutrition-wise that we're trying to do. Like what so kind of cravings? Like more, it's more carbs. Uh, more cravings for more carbs or more other things that are bad for us. Okay. Cravings for pizza and all kinds of stuff. I know for me, and this, I know that the, the science shows this too. That that when you are we don't get enough sleep that you crave more uh, carbs because the carbs kind of uh, are, are an attempt to regulate the serotonin. Mm, yeah. Um, when you don't get, when you don't get enough sleep, your body actually interprets that as stress mm -hmm. and it initiates your stress response and it raises stress hormones like cortisol. And that will cause your body to crave carbs because when your stress response is high, um, your body thinks that you're running from a tiger you know, prehistoric days. Right. And when you're running from a tiger, one thing that you need is quick energy. Well, that's why you're craving quick digesting carbohydrates. Mm. Yeah. And, but yeah, a lot of people don't know that when you go without quality sleep for an extended period of time, your body will initiate the stress response. Which, you know, it's, I, I don't think I get to talk to someone with ADHD who doesn't have some kind of sleep issue. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I completely, I, I get it. It's, um, well, here's here's something there that, that we can tie right into that. Um, serotonin, in order to get good sleep, you have to get into the deeper phases of sleep, like mm -hmm. deep sleep and REM sleep. Well, what controls that is how well our melatonin production is. If our melatonin production is high when we go to sleep, then we will sleep, then we will get into the deeper phases of sleep. Well, melatonin is also made from the amino acid tryptophan. It's made the same way that serotonin is made. And so if we're doing things that are sabotaging our brain chemistry, like we've been talking about, we're also sabotaging our melatonin production. So if we eat a dinner with protein, and let's say we eat that steak and mashed potatoes and a Coke, we're eating protein, so we're getting enough tryptophan to make seroton serotonin and melatonin, but the carbs are spiking blood sugar, which spikes insulin, and that blocks the tryptophan from getting in. And so we don't make the melatonin. And so eating a, a poorly designed dinner is disastrous for our sleep. Okay, so I've, I've, sounds like I may have had a, the, the wrong idea about something. Um, eating, because I thought if you have a little bit of, of carbs before bed, that can help you sleep. Uh, a little. You're right. A okay. little. Um, actually, a good one is simply a glass of milk because milk has uh, a good amount of protein in it, mm -hmm. but it also has just about the right amount of carbs in it to get. There's there's a whole story back behind this. And it's kind of complicated, but there is something to having a little bit of carbs in order to basically shoot tryptophan into your brain and get everything else out of its way. Because, you know, like. Uh, tryptophan is trying to get into your brain, but so are a lot of different things. And having a little bit of carbs basically gets everything out of its way. So it could be helpful for sleep onset, but it can disrupt sleep quality and duration. If you have a lot more carbs, like if you have mashed potatoes and a Coke, um, it will destroy those brain chemicals. Um, it will also cause low blood sugar by, because when your, your blood sugar spikes, and insulin removes the extra sugar, a lot of times insulin will remove too much and now your blood sugar crashes. And when your blood sugar crashes, that will prevent you from getting into the, into deeper phases of sleep on its own. So my um, bowl of cereal at night is a bad idea? Probably not. It, it, I love fruity pebbles, but they're terrible for oh, your sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, once had, I once had a client, I was working with the whole family and, and they were doing some kind of experimenting with their diet. And this uh, 10 year old girl who came into my office and uh, through this kind of experiment that they were sort of all doing as a family. 
and they she came back and I and I told her like you need to write a book with this title. Um, she said French fries make me sad, <laughs> and I was like, it, it just there was something that was just so like brilliant and yet like on point about that. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like she she recognized like this food that she loves like was affecting how she felt. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I always was, think about that. What was it? There was a book that I that I uh, saw one time. I don't know if I read it or not, but it was called Prozac and Potatoes or something like that. <laughs> it, you know, brought the two of those things together. So um, yeah, it's pretty crazy what people can what kind of titles people can come up with. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the the state of you know, all, all this stuff is like really, I think, valuable uh, information for us. Um, where is the state of research about all of this stuff that you've shared with us? Um, the state of research on how your metabol how you metabolize certain foods, I I think that that is pretty solid. Okay. The what is emerging is how this all affects diseases, whether they are metabolic diseases like diabetes and cancer, or neurological diseases. Um, that is where the, uh, the research is still not super early, but still a lot earlier than mainstream will accept. And so, um, you know, you kind of have to decide where you lie. Um, some people want to have full acceptance from all of the medical community. No problem. Uh, some people want to find those outliers and, you know, follow them. Okay. You know, I'm somewhere in the middle, I think. Um, but the the way nutrition affects diseases is I still, I believe, still in the early phases. I think that there's some really exciting things going on. But uh, as far as the mainstream, it's still early. So, but it's it's very much too exciting to ignore, in my opinion. Okay. And mm-hmm. um, well, I definitely think that, that you know, this is... This is one of those episodes that I think might be worth listening to more than once because uh, we've given a lot of uh, of really good information. And I'll definitely uh, link up the uh, the video that you, you mentioned you'll send me um, mm-hmm. uh, at, onto the website. Because, uh, you know, I, I think that when we're doing everything right and as far as in the management of our own ADHD it, and we're still feeling like it has still we, – we, we have the sense that it could still be better, right? Mm-hmm. I think diet's one of those things that it's that try different things. And so I think it's, it's important to have some of that education behind it and, and that, that why that you, you describe so, uh, so well as, as to what you want to understand at that deeper level. And so it's, uh, it will definitely takes a little bit of reviewing, uh, to really, as I'm thinking through some of the things that even I'm, uh, doing in my own diet. Um, mm-hmm. But um, so I want to thank you for sharing everything that you have with us. But there is one more thing that we have to do before I let you go. Okay. And that's the random question round. <laughs> this is <laughs> okay. the part of the show that has nothing to do with ADHD, which then paradoxically has everything to do with ADHD. <laughs> so, all right, uh, bring it on. All right. All right. All right. Um, so, if you have a, an invention or an improvement upon an existing product or service that's out there, what would it be? Um, the cameras, <laughs> you know, web, web cameras, just to make sure that there's no way to tell that it's actually on. <laughs> Wait, web the electrical tape doesn't look very good. <laughs> Wait, I'm, I'm trying to follow that. Wait, hey, hey. Web cameras. Mm-hmm. What about web always, cameras? I was always petrified that, you know, somebody would sneak, especially when I, when I was uh, in the corporate world. I was always petrified that somebody was sneakily turning on from, turning on those web cameras and watching what I'm doing. <laughs> and electrical tape, everybody can always see when you have the electrical tape on there. <laughs> so, and I, and my webcam well. has a blue light around it when it's when it's on. Well, but what if they turn that blue light off? I suppose. What if somebody a... hacks your thing, hacks your system, and turns that blue light off, and you're uh, back in the back dancing in your underwear or something? I guess next time I uh, I do my work in my underwear, I should probably put a sticky <laughs> note over my uh, my, <laughs> my camera. Okay, so um, the my next question uh, would be, and I typically just randomly think of these on the spot, and I don't always do it well. Um, what would be the most brain healthy meal 
you could make and who would you want to eat it with um you know actually i have we can also give your uh, your listeners uh six shake recipes uh it's a download that you can get yeah, there are five minute breakfast smoothie recipes and they are fantastic for your brain okay and just so, to, to clarify that's 15 minutes for my audience i just wanted to let everyone know <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we can give that. So that's that's what I would eat. Uh, who I would eat it with? Um, Jack Nicholson. Why? I think just over the course of his career, Jack Nicholson has played some really cool roles and really kind of like just his personality. He's got to be one of the most interesting people in the world to talk to. You know, just one of those guys that's always just relaxed. No matter what role he's playing in, he's telling everybody, yeah, this is what's going on, and I don't care if you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought he'd be so interesting to get to know. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Let me think of one more random question as I'm like looking around my office just to like get an idea sparked. Um. What's the grossest thing you've ever eaten? Oh, um, oh, what do they call that? Uh, sea urchin. Oh, I forget. When you go to a, uh, a calamari. Japanese... No, no, it's not calamari. It's it's not unagi. It's something. It's sea urchin, and it looks like when you get it, it looks like vomit wrapped in electrical <laughs> tape. <laughs> I remember getting some of these things. I was there with some friends, and a cousin of mine was like, you know, we should get this and try it and split an order. And we got it, and you looked at this thing, and that's what it looks like. It looks like vomit and electrical <laughs> tape, and you kind of squeeze it with these chopsticks, and it started to overflow. It was the grossest thing I've ever seen, and we ate it, and we both ran to the bathroom and puked it up. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> it was gross. <laughs> was it like a, seaweed, like a seaweed wrap or something, or...? Yeah, it must have been seaweed. I mean, it looked like electrical tape, but yeah, it had to have been seaweed, but that was the grossest thing I've ever had. And I've eaten some, you know, I can slug down anything. You know, you can make me a shake and put, make it taste as gross as you want. And I don't have a problem, but that thing, wow. If I see that, I start getting the heaves. Carl, thank you so much for, for spending the hour with us. Um, let people know again where they can reach you and um you know websites and podcasts and all that kind of stuff and then we'll call it a show all righty uh well my home on the internet is nutrition to the edge.com that's where i do my blogging and uh, i have my course and uh, posting my podcast and whatnot and then if you're on the road and you prefer podcasts my show is called the i'm too busy for nutrition podcast and so that you can get on itunes or on stitcher and I get on there and I rattle on and on about all kinds of stuff. So do you remember <laughs> what, what the episode that I, was that I, that I liked that I really, that I contacted you? I think it was like episode, episode two. two, episode two It's called where energy and focus uh, come from. And actually the one right behind it uh, talks about your appetite. And that one was actually one of the most commented about because nice. your appetite is very important. As I'm listening to my stomach growl right now, uh, <laughs> So, Carl, thank you so much. This has been great. This has sort of been a different kind of show, um, and I really appreciate it. I, lo I love being a student, so it's uh, um, I, I definitely learned a lot from it. So I really appreciate what you're doing, and I wish you the best of luck to everything that you're doing out there with uh, Nutrition to the Edge. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Eric. I really appreciate coming on here. I think it was awesome. So thanks a lot. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of ADHD Rewired. And if you're new to the show, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We are more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. You can see a full outline of this and all other episodes with all the links and other resources mentioned during this interview at ADHDrewired.com. 
Help support this podcast by checking out my sponsors. I use Zoom video conferencing nearly every day, and so can you. Go free or go pro. But please, go to erictippers.com slash Zoom so they know that I sent you. And you can get a free audiobook from Audible at erictivers.com slash Audible. And next time you shop Amazon, use the Amazon search portal at ADHDrewired.com. A small percentage of your purchase will go to support this show. And it doesn't cost you anything extra. You can also support this podcast by leaving an honest rating and review in iTunes or Stitcher. This really helps other people find this show. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. Don't just be a passive listener, be an active member of the ADHD Rewired community. We are on Facebook. You can like our page, but please submit your request to join our free and growing community. And don't forget to check your other inbox because I screen everybody before they come into our community. Looking for a coach? If you're still listening at this point and you answered yes, come to my website at ADHDrewired.com and schedule your free 20-minute consultation or call me at 224-993-9450. Is your school, business, or organization hiring speakers? I provide fun and engaging presentations full of practical solutions that both educate and entertain. Hire me for your next professional development day or corporate training event. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash talks. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.